Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks a lot, Sherry, and thank you, Global Patties. And hey, everybody, thank you for joining us today on this wonderful show. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor's support, and they help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing the presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and occasional guest co-host Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. I can't say that enough. We have a great show all set for you today with Jesse and Bobby Luke uh, doing research for hire. But more on that in a moment. Hey, Kim, how are you doing this first uh, first couple days towards the end of winter? I'm getting tired of winter. It was 60 degrees two days ago. It's 20 degrees today, and Ugh. it's supposed to be 30 degrees the rest of this week. I'm about done with this. Absolutely. You know, part of my spring routine is is looking at uh, uh, looking at the catalogs and thinking about uh, replacements with packages and or, or uh, nukes. Uh, the Have you heard how the weather's impacted uh, the queen producers and package producers? Well, at least I've heard down in the south things are have been slowed down uh, mm. a couple, uh, up to a couple of weeks. If you're expecting packages in early April, it's going to be late April probably. And that's for from Texas, I suppose Texas across Georgia, yeah, the, the Gulf area. states, right? Yeah, yeah, and I, I haven't heard. Well, we talked to John Miller the other day, and I guess the pollen, all, um, uh, the almond pollination went pretty good this year. So maybe the packages out of California won't be so far delayed yeah there's a lot to be said for average <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i wish i should have told my parents that anyways uh so you know uh there's a lot in going around on the the internet uh on uh, oxalic acid changes uh, from the epa and the the how it's been not registered but what is it the how it's measured well i'm gonna be honest i don't I don't have all the details, but um, I think we're going to get Randy Oliver here directly, who's been doing some of this work and working with the EPA on this. And uh, I think we can get it. I think we can get it straight so that everybody will be on the same page. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to having him on the show. He's really established himself through his research as the go-to source for all things Varroa and oxalic acid. It'll be good. Yep. So how's it, Honeybee Obscure coming? You guys are doing a good job, it sounds like. Uh, Jim and I have been doing okay. We've got uh, some in the can, some coming up. You know, we ran into a series of pamphlets uh, put out before 1900, in the late 1800s, and 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 one of them is a dictionary. And it's amazing to look at what has changed and what hasn't changed in, in the words and the phrases and the descriptions that beekeepers use in 100 plus years. So you're not reading anything about a hive monitoring app for your iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kim, you're one of the best read beekeepers I know. Have you been uh, reading any new books on beekeeping lately? Hey, Jeff, I tell you, I ran into something just last week, end of last week. It's a book put out by uh, BIP, the Beekeeper Bee Informed Partnership group of people. And what it is, basically, it's a how to be a commercial beekeeper. It, the title is uh, Commercial Beekeeping Field Guide. 
And if you're heading in that direction, now this isn't only for commercial beekeepers. Sideline and hobbyists are going to get something out of this because there's a lot of good fundamental information here, like how much does a full soup or a honey weigh, you know, th those kind of things. It, it, it's divided kind of into like three sections, and the first section is how to run a commercial beekeeping business. Basically, it's got, you know, things like your home base, you know, the buildings you're going to need, how big they're going to need to be, and, and what you're going to use them for, the hot room, the extraction room, the wax processing in the packing room, your wood shop, and vehicles, all about the vehicles you're going to be driving because you're going to end up having more than one. And here's a one of the things that I, that was in there that was just, just absolutely great was a list of 25 things you should have in the cab of every truck you own. Here's one of them. And what they do is in the whole book, oh, every two or three pages, they have something called a BIP tip. And it's a, like a highlighted box. And it's, it's just this little one or two sentence reminder sort of thing. And here's one from talking about your truck, things that should be in your truck. Always carry a few jars of honey and business cards. You never know when you'll meet someone with a potential new yard or orchard that can become a bee yard in the future. I yes. mean, that's that's just blinding flashes of common sense, but who thinks of it? <laughs> the next section is about the uh, the, the um, equipment you're going to use. I mentioned box sizes and weights. What's a full seep, deep super of honey weigh? What's a full medium of uh, uh, 10 frame, full 10 frame medium super weigh? Those sorts of things. And then, and then it talks about your bee yards, where to find them, and then what kinds of things to look for. And here's one of the BIP tips that's on that chapter. Take a picture of the lock combination or the gate knot so you can remember it and return it as it was. Or add the combination to the yard name you stored in your GPS. I mean, nice. again, you know, blinding flashes of common sense, but it's just good ideas. The next is um, when you're picking out a bee yard, what are you going to do in that bee yard? Not all bee yards are cut out to be the same. Is it going to be a mating yard, a holding yard? honey production yard, queen rearing, all these things. And what do you need for those so that they work best for you? So that when you go looking, you don't start, you, you start looking for the right thing right off rather than hoping you can find something. The third section is about problems and solutions. And, and there's a lot of problems. There's problems with, with brood, adult bees. Uh, there's problems with, with, well, what aren't there problems with Jeff? <laughs> That's, yeah, that's, that's right. that, that, that's the thing. And, and, and this is going to tell you all the, uh, how to treat for Varroa. You know, what do you use? How do you use it? What's legal? What's not? Where do you get it? Uh, they got a list of suppliers, all the suppliers in that book. And they got, they've got a lot of uh, resources listed, like where do you find a pollinator um, uh, broker for almonds? You know, and they've got eight or 10 of them listed there. And, it's four, four inches by six inches by probably about three quarters of an inch thick. It fits in your shirt pocket or it's easily in the, the, the glove box of your truck. And, and uh, like I said, it was made, put up by BIP. Their, their field people added to it. They hired a whole bunch of uh, people, the good people, for reviewing it. And it was designed by our own Kirst Kirsten Trainer, who uh, made it look good, useful. Wonderful. Yeah. To get it. It's thirty dollar a thirty dollar contribution to BIP. You go to their web page and and the uh, link will be on our web page, so you can just go right there. Thirty dollars to the contribution to BIP, and you'll have it in a few days. It's the best thirty dollars you're ever going to spend, Jeff. Definitely sounds like it. I love um, Be Informed Partnership. They have a it's a great resource for all beekeepers, whether you're commercial, sideliner, hobbyist. And you know the other book they have available out there is uh, Bee Pest and. Uh, I don't think it's bee pest and pathogens, but bee diseases and pest, I think, is the title. And uh, it's a great resource. I think it's another donation of uh, $42 or something. It's money well spent. So, Kim, who, are, who who's our guest for this afternoon? You know, know them pretty good, don't you? Well, we've got some old friends today coming in today, Jeff, uh, Jesse and Bobby Luke. And they run their own business. They they run uh, the business that they run is they hire out for companies that are testing chemicals that are going to be around bees, and mm. and and those companies need information for the EPA. Whenever you put something into the environment, EPA wants to know what it is and what it's going to do to mammals and birds and pollinators and people. 
And yeah. these are the people that go out and find out how it works with pollinators. Most companies don't have good beekeepers on staff. Uh, it's something that they don't wouldn't use year round, and you got to have a good beekeeper out there doing the kind of research. Jesse and Bobby have a passion for bees and a passion for science, and I think the two combined make a good pair. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to them. But first, a message from our friends at Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybee's response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we want to welcome Jesse and Bobby Luke to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. You bet, Jeff. Well, I think we're in for um, a treat today. I've known I've known Jesse for gee, what over ten years now. I think we met at a bee meeting a long time ago, and then several times after that. But then you started writing for Bee Culture on a regular basis, so we got to know each other fairly well. But today, we're, what we want to talk about is what you do when you're not writing for Bee Culture, you and Bobby together. And you have a company, as I understand it, called Luke Egg. And, and now I'm going to just get out of the way and say, tell us what you guys do and how it relates to bees and beekeeping and beekeepers and big egg and all of the rest. Well, it... <laughs> It'd be easier to go back just a little bit of how we got into it. So we started our company in 2017 and it made it more of a focus on bees. But before that, we worked in other uh, companies like CROs, which are contract research organizations. It's basically scientific mercenaries. Um, so back in about 2010 is when the U.S. really started caring more about how pesticides affected honeybees specifically, or bees in general, but mostly honeybees at the time because of commercial beekeepers. Um, so they started following behind Europe and deciding that they need to do a whole lot more testing. And so at the time, I was working for a CRO in central North Carolina, and they started getting more requests for bigger studies. And surprisingly enough, most people don't like being stung repeatedly by really angry bees. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's kind of hard to find people who want to do that, but also have a scientific background and can separate beekeeping from science and then keep them in a way that you can do the experiments. So I ended up taking it over and doing honeybee research in different countries across the U.S., taking over for the group leader for all of the work here in North America. Um, that's how I ended up meeting you was going to the North American beekeeping conferences because yeah, it's nice when somebody else will pay for those trips. Let me interrupt you for a second, Jesse, and, and have you explain what CRO is. Okay, so the CROs are contract research organizations. Okay. They're companies that a bigger company pays to do research, um, sometimes for monetary reasons, but also for, uh, I guess, political reasons or things like that. So, for example, when we do the work, they play us a flat rate as they don't have to pay us uh, insurance benefits, things like that. And we have to have our own sites and handle everything. Basically, we just hand them a report at the end of what works, what doesn't with some pictures. And they're paying us to produce a report and that's it. Um, so they don't have to deal with having extra employees to do that type of work when they only need it sometimes or, or things like that. And it keeps it from being more biased because they're paying us to do work outside of it. So if their chemical doesn't work, it doesn't phase us to say, hey, this is horrible. You can't do this. We're going to have to change something. So it's it's a little bit less biased. Okay. That, that makes sense. And CROs aren't something I really knew about. I don't think you did either, did you? Not really. When I started working there, it kind of fell in my lap after I had my master's because I had worked in efficacy of pesticides, but it was more of testing the pest that it was supposed to kill. 
And there was a job opening at the CRO to test agricultural pesticides. And so I started doing that. And then the bees became so big and not just bees, but beneficial insects as well. So in the off season, we would be testing things like beneficial or predatory spider mites, ladybugs, um, bumblebees, anything that we could raise in a lab and, and work on the inside. So it kind of grew from there until I was traveling everywhere eight to 10 months a year because the beekeeping season never ends in some places. Um, so it pretty much turned into just bees. And then I um, interviewed Bobby for a job and he started there. They had a little bit of an issue having a married couple working together and it got a little difficult. And then we got a job offer at a different CRO that offered us about twice as much as our salary was currently. So <laughs> nice. we went there. Well, good. So you do have a background that lends itself into the CRO business model that you are currently working in. My undergrad from NC State was in botany, which I think is now plant biology because botany is, I don't know, they didn't like the word. And then I did my master's there in entomology. Um, I have a family history of beekeeping. So that was easier from that side. Yeah. And then Bobby's. Yeah, I have a a uh, bachelor's in biology, a bachelor's in environmental studies, <clears throat> and a master's in biology. And I've worked uh, for my master's thesis. I worked with social insects, which bees, of course, are. Very good. Oh, good. Thank you uh, for the background. I appreciate that. Yeah. It, it Usually people that work for us, we require at least a bachelor's in something biology related. In some cases, we've tried to hire people that had beekeeping experience, but a lot of times that doesn't work. Well, like it, it doesn't translate to a scientific experiment because things you're taught in beekeeping aren't necessarily how you can do things in science. And they'll be like, well, this is stupid. Why would I do this? And they do <laughs> an experiment. So it, that can sometimes a little bit of background can hurt you and things like that. It's easier to teach someone with a biology degree that doesn't know anything in field stuff or bees than it is to teach a beekeeper. 99% of the time. Oh, I can tell you a quick story about those. We had a guy one time that started working for us that was a beekeeper on the side. And it turns out that he got all the bees we used for one of our experiments from a drug cartel off of Craigslist. <laughs> we had a really hard time with that. And they were stolen from some commercial beekeeper out in California. And they found them because there was a stamp on the inside of the hives, like a wood burner. And I didn't know when this guy said that it was his special brand from his bees and it wasn't. So that's one way to end a study real fast. <laughs> real quick. <laughs> you're So you're independent and, and either people come looking for you or you go to companies looking for, for work from them with a, offering them a specialty and, and they're doing something new and it's bee related. So they're looking for, for people who are technically skilled in that. Uh, what kinds of things, who comes to you and asks, asks questions? So, so first of all, just in a nutshell, what we, <clears throat> our main purpose uh, is a third-party unbiased research company that the, the, the EPA, when a, a, a pesticide or, you know, fungicide is, is being brought to market, they require a certain amount of data, such as, you know, the whole gamut of human health, um, mammalian health, avian health. And the last little bit is pollinator health. So in order to get a registration for a new pesticide, they have to run health risk assessments on honeybees or potential exposure. And, it, you know, the, the lethality or non-lethality to, uh, to bees. So we kind of encompass that, that arena. And uh, again, the, the EPA dictates to these companies that we you need we ha we need to have data to uh, assess the risk to pollinators and or honeybees in general. So our standard test setups, as far as app, you know, you, you 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 do an application, you expose the bees either in a laboratory, in the field. Uh, under a tunnel. I mean, there, there's different scenarios, but they're designed to, to answer specific questions, mostly with the toxicity to bees or how much this pesticide will interact with bees. So if you have, uh, you're spraying a pine tree, most likely a bee is not going to be anywhere near a pine tree for a food source. So sometimes 
uh, if they're if they're trying to register a product that's on a crop that does not have pollinators associated with their use, sometimes they can just do a, a very cursory laboratory experiment where where what we do is a a, a much more data intensive study where we want to ensure that whatever proposed application rates, whatever proposed uh, use for that, whatever crop they're using it on, we run the, the gambit of, are you, is, is sweet corn going to be different from almonds as far as the way that this pesticide interacts with, with that particular crop? In other studies, we just want to understand exposure at a certain level to bees through either their food or through contacts, will that cause a, a, a single bee to die or would it cause an effect within the hive that would render that hive over, over a long period of time or relatively over a growing season, will that impact the actual health of that hive and its ability to either reproduce and or survive? Hmm. So, so in a nutshell, that, that is what our focus is. And whatever data is requested from the EPA, we are bound by the rules of what we do as a research company that the EPA gets that data either in a report form or raw data form. So a, a common, I guess, complaint or, or some people that don't understand, they think that, well, these pesticide companies can perform this study and then they can hide the data. Or if it looks bad, they, they'll they just say that it never happened. But all the data that we collect goes to, uh, for these for these specific registration processes, the government gets that information as, as far as, you know, what we did and how we did it. Whereas we also get some pre-registration work where they want to just see, is this going to be a viable thing to put through the system? Because other people also don't understand the, the level of research and developments for, you know, pharmaceuticals, for, you know, household products, anything that has a chemical. There's a lot of research and development, and it's very expensive. So some companies might come up with an experimental pesticide or fungicide, and they just want to make sure right off the bat before they go to registration, is this going to cause enough or in, any significant issues that we can kind of see before and we're not going to spend a lot of money? So it's kind of twofold, but mostly it is for pesticide registration is, is what we do our work in. So if... If you have a company that is looking at uh, getting something registered on alfalfa, let's say, and and you're you're this the C, what is it? Yeah. Uh, working on this with them, you're going to have to provide the bees and the alfalfa. You got you got a five acre alfalfa patch out there, right? Yeah. So what kind of happens for us is. Usually, I mean, we kind of market, but there's only so many people that have enough money to do the work and they know the people that can do it. There's not that many of us. Again, people don't really like working in bees. It's, it's pretty difficult. You used to hire a lot of kids that were either still in college or had recently graduated. We could separate them out and have a quarter quit the first day of package installation. <laughs> I can believe that. Yeah. So, you know, if you can't make it through a package installation, you're not going to make it in a field. So a company will come up to us. We've had everything from LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, email, anything pretty much asking about work that we could do or couldn't do. And the way that it works is typically they'll have a chemical and say, hey, either when the first time we registered this, nobody cared about bees. So we need to go through and do a bee package for the EPA. Or they'll say, hey, we have a new chemical. We need to see how it works. Or in a couple of cases, they will be like, hey, we bought this new chemical that could be a varroa side. Can you test it out and see what happens? When they come to us, they don't want to do anything. They're going to give us the chemical and it'll have a certificate of analysis that proves what's in it. And that's it. So that's, that's really all they do with it. And we just keep them informed for the rest of the study. So they pay us and we give them basically an itemized list of what they're paying for. But like your example of alfalfa. So we've done alfalfa studies in the past. You have to do it in three different regions to prove that alfalfa growing here is different than or the same either way as Missouri and usually California because California is its own place. They count as basically their own country. The CDPR is insane. And 
they are like a couple steps above the EPA, the way that they do our stuff sometimes. Yeah, and you, and you have to remember, again, climatic conditions can, oh, yeah. can affect how a pesticide is taken up in a plant. If you're in a place that doesn't have a lot of sunshine versus somewhere that's really hot and sunny, you're going to have a different expression of that pesticide and the potential effects that it could have either on the plant or insects that interact with it. That makes sense, yep. We have to have application equipment. We have to have auditors. So if it's a GOP study, which means good laboratory practices, it's under FIFRA. It basically means that we have auditors that watch everything we do. And if we screw up, they write it down and document it and then tell us what we did wrong. And then we're basically paying people to berate us. It's really fun. <laughs> auditors, we've known them for a long time. And I buy them red pens for Christmas because they write so much of it out on our stuff. I'm sure they need a box to read. But um, we have to find everything. We have to supply the bees. And they can't just be regular bees. We learned that the hard way several times. Um, in North Carolina, we have a master beekeeper program, which is becoming more common for states now. And I needed bees for a study in a hurry. So I bought 20 hives from a master beekeeper that swore they were in good shape. And I use the slides from pictures of his hives now to go over diseases and pests in hives. <laughs> I'd never seen varroa mites on a queen before his hives. I'd never <laughs> smelled European fowl brood. I'd never seen tracheal mites. I thought they were a joke. It was horrible. And you can't say how a pesticide affects bees when they're in that bad of shape because you can't say, well, obviously it just kills them. It's like, well, they were going to die anyway because they're horrible. Everything dies. So we try to keep our bees in a better shape or we have a supplier that does really good. Right now, we use the Carolina Honey Bee Company in Traveler's Rest in South Carolina. We've used them for, what, six, seven years now? Yeah. Something like that. His bees are awesome. They're usually really chill and they hardly ever give us varroa problems. We like to start with less than three per hundred maximum, you know, so it's not that much coming out of the packages. And if we get them early enough, we'll treat them before they go into a study. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, all of the, the equipment that we use has to be new uh, be, because, you know, there could be an issue where if you used old frames or an old box or an old feeder that it could have residue. So we want to, we, we try to eliminate as many outside influences as we can to really target what is the effect of this or potential effect of this pesticide on the health of honeybees. So if you think about it, that's where a lot of the money comes in. We have to buy new packages. We have to buy new equipment. Usually these studies are a minimum of 50 hives starting out and they want them at least doubles when we start the studies. That means we're forcing a package into a double by May, June. We have to get all new smokers, hive tools. Every hive has its own hive tool so you don't cross-contaminate. Uh, boxes and boxes of gloves. Your bee suits have to change between untreated and treated. I mean, it's it's a lot of work and just keeping everything separated and training people how to do the work. So it's a lot. Plus the alfalfa or, you know, whatever your crop is, you also have to grow it in a place that doesn't have a history of whatever pesticide you're testing. So if it's a new pesticide... It's not that hard, but if it's an older pesticide that's been registered for a while, typically you're going to be using it on a crop that is already registered for, which means it can be really hard to find a place that doesn't have it. We had to have a study on citrus maybe seven, eight years ago, and we couldn't find a citrus grower on either coast that had clean crops that we could use. We ended up having to switch to cotton, which is not a whole lot easier. A couple of things. And some of these things are probably <clears throat> going to be looking at this, these bees over an extended period of time. You have exposure and then, okay, they were exposed this season. Are they going to overwinter? Yeah. Um, and, and you're going to overwinter them in several different places so that you could say, yeah, in the north they don't and in the south they might or something. And then when you're done with one of these experiments... Another question first, how long do these experiments last usually? And then when you're done, you got 50 hives you got to get rid of and and 50 hive tools and all of those things. <laughs> yeah, so some things are easier than others. All right, so if you're <laughs> my favorite study and the one that I kind of really started with and helped adapt for the U.S. Um, was the colony feeding studies, and they don't require crops. We do a 
like the top feeders and we treat them with a sugar solution that's spiked with whatever the pesticide is. Like usually Bobby handles more crop residues, like applications to a crop. And then we use bees and collect their nectar and pollen to see what the residues are. So we kind of know what the exposure level is. Or, or, or we will actually collect the nectar and pollen by hand, yeah. send that for analysis. That way we know at this rate, this is what the bees actually would be exposed yeah. to. From polymers. Yeah. So then on our end, we're like, all right, well, let's see what we can do. So we usually have like five rates plus some untreated, and we'll try to get a good range of what they could be exposed to. And then something that's a little bit too high, something that's probably not going to affect them. And we feed them. Now, these high, these studies are massive. So we have 12 sites in these studies. Each site has one of each type of treatment. So usually it's two uncontrolled and five treated. So if you have 12 sites of that, you're looking at 84 hives. We have to start with at least 160 to get to those 80-some hives to make sure we have good hives to start with and that they're similar. And we have to have a monitoring hive at each site. So we pull samples as often as we can of pollen traps and nectar out of one that's just sitting over to the side to check environmental incoming. Like, did somebody spray a crop nearby or did somebody throw out... um, did somebody treat their cows? That happened one time. They had like ivermectin that they treated their cows with and they came into one of our sites. Um, so that hive is just for that. But it's really cool because sometimes in bee culture, I've wrote about our um, pollen analysis, which is one of my favorite things to see what's blooming when. And we get to see what all the bees in the different places bring in. Totally not related to the rest of that, but it's oh, it's one of my favorites. We're, you know, trying to raise 160 hives as big as we can and then have these 12 sites everywhere. So we feed them for six weeks, twice a week. We take that sugar syrup and once we put it in, when we go back to feed them again, we'll pull that out and measure how much they eat because sometimes if it's too high, it'll still have repellency. So you also have to document that they didn't eat it. And then at the end of the six weeks, we keep them. Usually those studies start in June. We start feeding around June. They have uh, high scales under them. So we monitor their weights hourly, but we really only use the midnight weights so it's consistent. And then we monitor them until the next April. Well, wow, that's, that's a lot of work. You must be following some sort of repeatable process for all of these tests. We have a CCA, which is a colony condition assessment. And we go through every single frame and do percentages of everything in the hive by 5% per frame side. That, that includes pollen stores, honey stores, nectar stores, uh, open brood, eggs, cat brood, and cat brood. And empty. And, and the amount of bees cover each frame. Yeah. So if we're going through a frame and I'm looking at it and let's say Bobby's writing for me, which also he would be an observer instead of writing, but for the purposes of this. So I'm calling out, I'll say there's 45% bees on this side, 50 on this side, because you have to do the bees first so they fly away. And then you go back to the front side and you say, all right, well, there's 20 nectar on this one, 35 cap brood. So that's 55. There's uh, 20 open brood and then there's 20 empty. And then you go through. And God help you if you make a mistake and it doesn't add up to 100 after you've done 40 hives of them. <laughs> if you're doing a bunch of quads, that's also fun. Um, so we do those assessments nine times over the studies. We do them before it starts to make sure we know what we're working with. And then we move them out to the sites because the sites are also equalized. You don't want to have a single with a quad because they're going to get robbed and die. And if you had a single with a high rate treatment and you have a quad that's untreated, they're going to end up treating themselves by stealing from that little hive. So each of these little sites we have are at least a mile apart and they're blocked by size. So then we check and make sure we didn't kill the queens when we move them or something like that, you know, drop them off the back of the truck. And then we do these assessments. We usually have around August or September when we do those, we check our varroa counts and then we'll treat them. And then at our last one, sometimes we'll check them again just to make sure what they look like before the winter time. And then we do another assessment right at the end of winter. And then one more going into the spring to see how they not only their overwinter survival, but do they swarm? Are they look healthy? Are they ready to go? Like, what do they look like at the end? How many people do you have operating? How many hives on the 4th of July? Have we ever had off the 4th of July? No. We actually, two years ago, we started feeding on 4th yes, of July. Yes, we did. That's happened a couple times. In the summertime, we don't count time off. We don't have weekends. Nighttime isn't real. Sometimes we worked a 30-hour day one time in a tunnel study. That was horrible. (laughs) 
we usually have teenagers to t- early 20s working for us. We have Greg right now, who's a PI. Um, he has a bachelor's degree, so he kind of handles the higher up stuff if we don't. But we're much more hands-on now as our own company. So it's that was one of the things that we wanted to be more in control of what we did. So your your question about the equipment, I was trying to think. So circle back. Yeah, circle back. <laughs> so, it's really unfortunate that we beekeepers are sometimes because, all right, when we end these studies, like the colony feeding studies, we have enough equipment for 160 hives to be triples, right? That's a lot of equipment that is less than a year old, painted and barely used. And if they, you know, you're not going to have all your packages survive. So some of those boxes never even had a bee touch the frames. But because of the way the beekeepers act, we can't donate it. We can't sell it. We can't do anything with it but throw it away. Or as you've seen in some of my articles, I've made turkey pens and quail pens and garden boxes and (laughs) shoulders and cases. But we had one of our girls that was working for us. She meant well, and she donated some to one of the county beekeeper clubs. And they absolutely flipped when they found out where it was from or why we had boxes that were numbered. And one of them had like questioned suing us for contaminating their bees. Like, what's your mite count? And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, then don't talk to me about killing your bees if you don't know what your mite count was. Yeah, so typically it's it's a really sad day to go to the landfill and have to dump boxes and boxes and boxes of... Brand new equipment, basically. Yes, and, and with, with the honey included. And we see all kinds of people asking, diving after. asking if they can have it. And then we explain what we do and they quickly scurry away. <laughs> At one time, there were two guys that jumped in the dumpster after it, and they didn't, they were very spry. I'll give them that. I didn't think they would be able to pop back out of there with all that equipment. Well, I gotta, I gotta believe that perhaps some aspects of some of these experiments might, might, uh, uh, I wouldn't even say contaminate, but at least affect some of the equipment. But I gotta believe a lot of it wouldn't because you're exposing these bees to real world situations, right? Well, it's not only that, but we take samples. So at those assessments that we do, we take nectar uh, samples. We take honey samples because those are obviously different things because the nectar is much more fresh and came in while the honey is stored. We take pollen samples. Well, it's bee bread um, at every one of those, including in the spring. And usually we don't have residues in the spring, no matter what the chemical was or the class of insecticide is rarely there by the next year. Or it's in such small amounts that we can't even quantify it. But we still can't give it away. Yeah. So, so to to help your the the listeners out there not have an absolute panic attack, we are allowed to take the bees from that equipment, shake on to new equipment, so we we can keep the bees. But it's if we do another study, we have we can't use those same bees, but we can use those bees because that would be terribly wasteful. It'd be awful. In some cases, like if a sponsor gets a little overconfident in their chemical and the high rate is too high and just blast them, they get double bagged and gone. Looks like we're throwing bodies in a dumpster. Yeah, if there's a risk of contamination, we, in in the hive, say if a hive died in the middle of a study, that would be removed immediately, bagged up and taken away. We have to really watch out for robbing. As you know, bees can move honey and, and nectar all over their own hive. But when they start bringing in high, either from a weak hive or a dead hive, that can completely mess up the, the intent of the study. I, I can see how we're there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Do you test for wax contamination? T- typical. So w- again, we go in with fresh, they yeah. build their own, but typically most of the chemicals we work with are not lipophilic. lipophilic. So it does not penetrate the wax. And the other thing is that we there's such a short residue time. I mean, we, we don't do a study over 10 years. So it's, it's typically, you know, one year max just because we want to capture the, the, the buildup of the hive uh, the, during the growing season, the overwintering, and then the success of overwintering into the building back up. It's very interesting to see overall, though, because with the residues, I mean, you would think you would be concerned about the wax. and I won't name names, which is really hard, as you probably know for me not to do. But we've tested wax before, and it will come back with all kinds of crazy stuff, including things we never treated with. And it's almost always because labs that test them had contamination, and they never thought to look. And because they don't know bees, they don't know how weird that would be for like certain things to be in it. 
they just think it's supposed to be there and you have to explain to them. And then when they run it again, it's clean. Or on the alternative side, if you, it, it doesn't happen in our bees, but when we've used other people's bees for studies in the field, which is why we don't do those anymore, Everything you can ever think of that might have possibly been recommended to treat varroa will show up in that wax. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it was registered 45 years ago. It, it's going to be in that wax. So that's why we use brand new equipment, which is also hard for us growing hives fast when they have to draw out frames. Yeah. So you're using plastic foundation? Yeah, we typically use the plastic. And if we can get it, it's double dip. But usually one of the more difficult things for us is that our work is never guaranteed because people don't want to pay as much money as it costs to do these studies if they don't have to. And the EPA is very slow. So they might not know until like this time of year that they need to do it. And then suddenly we need to order 200 packages of bees and get all the equipment in. You know, you call a bee company and they're like, we don't have any. So during a during a typical, I guess, season, um, how many of these experiments are you doing at the same time? Well, now that we run our own company, it's both harder and easier for us because we do less work. We just have less people. So, for example, last year we did, we finished one of the colony feeding studies, started another one, and we had two small plots for bobbies and pumpkins and hemp. It's not unmanageable by any means. But you're looking at 100 plus colonies of study generally, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a couple, three things going, two people taking care of three, 400 colonies, yeah, I can see a 30-hour day. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is that's crazy to think about is when you do these studies, the preparation for the study is way harder than the study itself. Because getting the bees, having everything set up in the apiaries, having the hives ready to go for the packages to go into, keeping the hives alive or the colonies once they're in there, making sure everybody's fed sugar syrup, making sure they have pollen. Did you put too many bees in one apiary? Do you have enough places? Did one of your landowners have a hissy fin decide they're suddenly allergic to bees? Um, did one of them decide that they're going to put all of the carbaryl in the world on one of their rose bushes in the backyard next to them because they don't understand? You know, did 14 of them die? Did they decide to swarm and requeen? And now you're chasing bees out of someone's chimney. There's so many things that can go wrong at the beginning. And then making sure you get your sites, you know, landowners back out at the last minute, your scales don't come in on time. Uh, you don't get your top feeders, which is the, one of the really important parts of a hive. If you're doing a, a top feeder for your study to, to treat them. Uh, I mean, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> That sounds like beekeeping, <laughs> generally. So, but how much lead time do you usually get? Enough or barely? Or um, do these? And I guess where I'm going with this is how well organized are the companies that you're working with? How how well organized are they to make your job not only easy but but that they can be confident in the results that you get? Well, unfortunately, most of the direction comes from the EPA and other government yeah. sources. So they, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about the government, but most of the people that are directing the need for data are not people that go outside very much. They don't, they don't really understand <laughs> how crops grow, the timing, how bees, and, and, and that's fine. And the next part is once that data is re requested, then you have a, a, another set of people that hand the money out to the people that are are are, are directing the study to us. So there's a lot, of, and we've had to we we are specialists in logistic logistics control. We have to scramble every single year, and it's just part of what we do. We understand that. We have a lot of vendors that understand that as well because they could be having a, you know, a, a short year. Then all of a sudden we've made up their profits quite a bit just because they knew at the last minute that we would be needing a lot of things. So that there's usually not a lot of lead time. But, you know, it is very rare that we get a call and someone says, we need to do the study ASAP. We're usually in talks with them because... They understand that they're going to they're going to get a data request. They so the people that we work with at uh, these pesticide companies, typically they are scientists. The ones that we directly work with, they have a lot more knowledge than the people that are giving them money, and typically a lot more understanding of how field conditions 
in impact studies than the government does. The government has a lot of good, smart people that do really good risk assessments, but the timing of, you know, trying to get a cucumber study done in October is not fly. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. You also have to keep in mind, though, these companies vary wildly. Like, you can't just say, oh, they're all great and they're all really organized or they're terrible. They're, it really, a lot of it depends on how their company is organized and also who you get as the sponsor representative. In the past, hopefully I don't get in trouble for naming this, but Bear is one of the best companies that we worked for as far as having their stuff together making their payments on time, knowing that they had work coming up, and they were really proactive in testing their chemicals before they were asked, which made our job a lot easier because our timelines, we knew what to expect. It, it was really helpful doing that. But in some cases, we've had sponsors that sort of knew bees, sort of didn't know bees, and would try to change the way we did the studies. And the EPA guidelines are just enough rope to hang yourself sometimes. So you can try to move them a little bit, but it's enough that if they don't quite like what you did, then you're going to do it again for free, <laughs> which is horrible, especially if you're on a small company by yourself. Yeah, and a, and a lot of companies, these companies that we work, understand that if they want to get a registration or a, a pesticide registered, every day they don't do that, they're literally losing money. So that usually... Uh, helps push the process for their approvals a lot faster. But, you know, it, it doesn't always work out. We've had to turn down, you know, a, a couple of studies just because we felt that there was no way that we could do this study correctly and get the data, the the valid data out of this. Yeah, I don't it, on that. That's another reason that we wanted to, uh, why we started our own company is because we have control over the work that we take we certainly did not do this to become multimillionaires or, or even a <laughs> multi-thousandaires. Uh, this was basically that we have a passion for bees. We have a passion for science. And it is a responsibility that we enjoy that knowing that we are in our own little way protecting bees. We're, we're protecting the environment. We're protecting, you know, food sources. We will not take on more work than we can handle. We will not do a study that is not gonna, is not going to give good results because if we kind of do it halfway and then the sponsor company says, "Well, this is what we wanted," it, it's just going to be bad all around. They're going to lose money and they're probably not going to come back to us. So, having our own business and kind of calling our own shots, accepting the work that that we really think is is worth it then that that to us, you know, helps us sleep at night and not in working 30 hours a day. <laughs> that'll make us sleep, yeah. I think it would help. I don't know, because I've had this argument a lot and I'll try not to get you too much hate mail there, Kim. But when we've worked with these companies, no one we have ever worked with, except for one exception who I would never work with again, but it didn't go that far. I have never felt like a sponsor tried to pull one over. They either knew what they were working with or when we came out and we're like, hey, this caused a problem. They're like, oh my God, how can we fix this? Not Never have they been like, can we fudge the data? Can we make this something else? They've always worked really hard to try to figure out what they could do to make it better. So like if we've had chemicals that if we sprayed, let's say we sprayed them at Bloom and that's what they wanted, but it killed the bees. Then we try to figure out how to do it differently. Can we spray them at night and not have the effect? Can we spray them a couple of days before bloom and not have the effect? Do we have to switch crops? Do we have to take this crop off the label? How can we make this better? Can it be used in certain you know, parts of the U.S. but not in others because of the way the plant works in that, that ecosystem? Um, there's so many different ways that it can be worked out, but never have I had a sponsor that I thought was shady about what they were expecting. Yes, and I think people have to understand you know, people have different views of large companies, especially dealing with food and pesticides. The last thing that any company wants is bad PR. If they if they were to fudge some data or kind of really tote that line that's that's not acceptable, first the EPA is is going to call them out on it. Second, if an incident happened, they would lose any and all profits they have ever even thought about making off that pesticide. So it, the, the evil corporate uh, entity is, 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 in our experience, it does not exist 
on the levels that we deal with. That's a good message. Oh, that's comforting. Yeah, it is. Um, and and my, my, we're running we're running long here, but what have we missed that you guys think is important? I'll I'll say real quickly that the data that we produce it is beyond the scope of anyone's possible understanding because it is so in depth that when we say we go out and evaluate the bees, it's not like your your typical honeybee keeper. They lift the lid, yet they look good. It, it's it's not that we record all. I mean, that is actually what we do is record data. It's like thirty thousand pages minimum. And the reason that we record so much data is because GLP or uh, good laboratory practices, you want to be able to repeat that study anywhere, anytime using the methodology that, that we did. So it'll be understood that, hey, if we did make a mistake, it was it was documented that we made a mistake or something changed. Therefore, the intactness of the study is still there because we said that a hurricane came and flooded oh, yeah. flooded half. The- <laughs> yeah, that was bad. Or the bears ate all of our hives the night we moved them. Ooh. Yeah. Uh. So one thing I would like to point out, or just as a, I guess, a PSA, you know, a lot of these issues with having internet available to everyone is they have the Facebook university degrees, so they think they know best. <laughs> In most cases, these big growers and farmers, they're not the problem for bees. They're not going to use an ounce of a pesticide more than they have to because they have a budget to meet. But you have, you know, Joe Neighbor out here that's, well, if I use the recommended dose of this, you know, home product, I should use the whole bottle and I won't have aphids on my roses and my wife will stop yelling at me, you know, or what's a label? And the biggest thing is that people don't really take personal responsibility. They want to blame someone else for things, you know. If you're having problems, you're going to have to test your bees. You need to talk to your apiary inspector, you know, and their biggest pet peeve is when people say their bees died, but they never check for their Varroa mite levels and they don't know what they were. So you can't really blame anything because Varroa is really the worst thing that we're dealing with across the board. You have to read labels. Those labels are there for a reason. People are paying us a ton of money to put our part on those. If you don't use the labels like they are on the directions, you you get what you get. And, you know... It, it's just about paying attention to what you're doing yourself and then making sure that you're not trying to blame someone else when you fail at what you're doing. Good advice. Yeah, Good advice. Is. Jesse and Bobby Luke, thank you very much for being here today. This has been um, uh, very eye-opening, and I appreciate your time. I appreciate the work you're doing. Yes, definitely. At least you know that we're crabby if you talk to us in the summer. <laughs> uh, it sounds like we were lucky to catch you here, so... Uh, we won't even try next summer. So thanks for being here and good luck. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Kim, thanks a lot for inviting uh, Jesse and Bobby to the show today. I didn't even know that CROs even existed till they were talking about the, the contract uh, or con- contract research organization. Yeah, they, they um, I knew I knew there were people out there that did it, but I didn't know how involved they got. And and it was good to get all of the background information. I think the thing that impressed me, well, two things that impressed me. One, the amount of equipment that they go through. You run a 150-colony wow, yeah. uh, experiment for a year. When you're done, that equipment gets trashed because nobody wants it. <laughs> and the other thing that amazed me was their, their colony collection assessments. When they go through every frame and every hive nine times during during an experiment, and they're measuring the percentage of bees, the percentage of honey, the percentage of pollen uh, that's stored on every frame. And uh, what's what's nine times, I don't know even how many frames, but they do it fast. The two of them, yeah. are, they're really practiced. They do it fast. And I think the other thing I like about uh, probably all of these people, but especially about this operation, is they don't have a vested interest in the outcome of their work. They don't care if it's bad on bees or good on bees. Well, they do, but it, it isn't going to affect them if it's bad or good because that's what the company has to deal with. From them, it's doing the work, take, getting the numbers, and, and making EPA happy. And I'm glad I got people out there that are worried about my bees as much as I am. I, I I enjoyed the interview. I look forward to having Jessica back, and now I can better appreciate what she's writing when she uh, does her articles for Bee Culture. It's, uh, I'm glad they were here. 
Well, that about wraps it up for this episode. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for our new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Microbials for their support of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us your questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? Yeah, Jeff, just one more thing. Um, I want to re- I want to reinforce questions and reviews on our webpage. What you put in there will benefit somebody else, and questions you ask will help us do a better job so that we don't leave things, uh, leave people wanting to know more. So uh, questions and reviews. That's it. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>